On today's Undercover Boss, prepare for an episode that will blow you away as we follow the journey of one of the youngest CEOs of the world as he goes undercover within his own company. Brace yourselves as he encounters the unsung heroes who silently shape the success of his organization. Stay with us to see what happens when this CEO, for the very first time on the history of Undercover Boss, gets fired. Michael Rubin is the founder and CEO of GSI Commerce. GSI Commerce is an e-commerce business which handles merchandising and shipping to other large companies and organizations like the NFL and MLB. GSI creates the websites for the products and they then store and ship the product directly to the customers. And this means that most online shoppers have used GSI systems to get their products. Mike loved business since he was a little boy and when he was 8 years old he sold stationery door to door and by the time he was 14 he opened his own ski shop Shop, and by the time he was 21, he had a business making $100 million. Being the CEO of a fast-running company, Mike is always working, and he mostly never has time to spend with his wife and daughter. He is an obsessed man, always trying to reach the next big goal. Mike has been thinking of a way to improve his business, and he came up with the idea to go undercover in his company. During the peak seasonal time for the company, he calls a meeting with his board members and reveals to them that he would be going undercover for a week. I'm stepping down as the CEO of GSI Commerce for next week, <laughs> not in total. <laughs> Everyone is surprised at first, but he explains to them that it will be good for the company. Mike will be going undercover as Gary, and his workers will be told that he's taking part in a TV show about seasonal jobs. He's a little nervous, as he's always been his own boss, and working under people might be a little challenging for him. For his first job, he flies to Richwood, Kentucky to work in the fulfillment center where they pack thousands of orders daily to be sent to customers. He meets with Matt who works as a floor supervisor and he takes him to a seasonal worker, Rochelle, and she teaches him how to load the trucks with the boxes. The job is very intense as the boxes come fast, but they manage to keep up with the load together. But as they were moving the boxes, Mike accidentally hits Rochelle on the face. I feel like we're getting... Oh! Oh, are you okay? No, not really. <laughs> Just be careful. They then start doing the much more easier task of stacking boxes, and Mike sees Rochelle using new techniques to speed up the work and be more productive. He's impressed to see a seasonal worker who will not be here the next season working that hard to increase the efficiency of the company. After Mike was done with his first day of work, he was exhausted, and when he first came here, he thought the job would be easy and that he would impress everyone, but he now knows just how hard it is and how hard his employees have to work to grow this company. The the next day, Mike travels to Florida to work in the call centers, and GSI receives more than 20 million calls a year, so it's important that the calls go well. He meets up with Adam, who takes customer complaint calls, and Mike just listens in for a few calls and sees how it's done. Mike was impressed with Adam's work, and when his turn came to take the calls, with some help from Adam, Mike accepts the calls and resolves the various issues of the customers. On their break, Mike learns that Adam has been working for a year after he had to leave his previous job because he lost his daughter during childbirth and because he was absent that day, Adam was fired. Uh, I ended up losing my daughter. And the day that I lost my daughter, I was unable to go in and work that Black Friday. And just due to that, they, uh, they said that my services were no longer needed. After the break, Mike sits with Danielle and takes the next customer call, which was a lot harder than before since the customer was not budging for his offer, and Danielle gets impatient and puts the customer on hold. She then takes the call and gets into an argument with the customer. May I speak now? Ma'am, ma'am, Elizabeth, not, not you're not letting me talk. You're not letting me talk, so I can't help you, I'm Elizabeth. Sorry. I'm sorry that you're having a hard time. Mike gets visibly upset by Danielle's behavior and the way she treated the customer and almost blew his cover. The call ends without getting resolved as the customer gets frustrated and just hangs up, and then Mike steps outside and lets out his anger. I went from heartbroken to extreme frustration and anger. Not what I expect of my employees. For his next job, he travels back to Richwood, Kentucky to work in the fulfillment center to work as a box patcher, and he meets with packing supervisor Greg, who immediately takes him to the packing area. He is put alongside Shannon, who teaches him how to pack, and Shannon is very fast and she does double the work. Mike is impressed with her speed and tries to follow under her, but it doesn't really go well as he only does half the requirement. During their lunch break, they talk about family, and he learns that Shannon works seven days a week to help her family out. On their next shift, Gary comes back with Mike's pack boxes, which had multiple problems. He tells him that he's not reaching the requirement and fires Mike on the spot. Between the issues with the boxes and, and your numbers, uh, we no longer need your services. Nothing I can do. No. 
Mike is shocked as he just got fired and he feels embarrassed about his performance and notes how hard the job is and he then thanks Shannon before leaving. And although Mike just got fired, his undercover time is still going and the next day he travels to another fulfillment center in Louisville, Kentucky to work on a night shift. Mike is determined to work this job well and he meets up with Cameron and he shows him how boxes are located and picked from their shelves. Mike follows suit for the first few orders and on their breaks, Mike meets Cameron's young daughter who has come to work with him. Hey baby. <laughs> Cameron doesn't get to see his daughter as much as he wants to, but he tries to make time whenever he can. On their next shift, Mike and Cameron start a competition on who can do certain tasks faster. And unsurprisingly, Cameron wins by a big margin, but they both have fun. And finally, Mike's undercover time has come to an end, and he's learned a lot during his time undercover, and one of the things that he's learned is to spend more time with his family. And he gained this perspective after he met Cameron and Adam. And next, Mike calls his employees to a GSI building to reveal his true identity. First in was Rochelle, who impressed him by her hard work, and he tells her that he's proud of her and offers her a full-time job at the company, and Rochelle is thankful for her new job and hugs Mike. Next in was Cameron, and he tells him that he admires both his work ethic and his dedication to raising his daughter right, and he gives him a thousand dollar gift card to get his daughter a great Christmas gift, and offers him a promotion in the company, and Cameron, teary-eyed, thanks Mike for the opportunity. Next was Shannon. I'm not actually Gary. I'm Michael Rubin, the founder and CEO of the company. <laughs> and he gives her $5,000 so she can spend it on her son. Next in was Danielle, and Mike was not happy with her, and now that she's in front of him, she apologizes and Mike gives her another chance, and promises to give better training to all employees so that this doesn't happen again. And on her way out, she promises that she will do great next time. Last in was Adam, and he tells him that he was blown away with his work ethic and attitude to customers, and he tells him that he was heartbroken with the story of losing his daughter, and it's made Mike reconsider his priorities in life. You know, one of the things that you talked about, saving money to get married, I know it's something you've been waiting to do. I'd like to put $10,000 toward your wedding. Adam is speechless by this, and he thanks Mike for his generosity. <laughs> I, 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 I'm speechless. Mike also wanted to share his experience with other employees, so he arranges his town hall to talk about his experience. He shows them highlights of his undercover time, and he gives a speech and promises to make the company better for everyone. He then thanks his employees before ending the event, and in the weeks since, all of Rochelle's hard work has paid off, and she now has a full-time position at the company. Cameron is on his way to becoming a supervisor, and he's attending a GSI leadership conference that spring, and his daughter also had the best Christmas ever. Shannon has put the $5,000 to good use and is helping her son's football team. Danielle underwent customer service retraining and she's no longer with the company. And lastly, Adam and his fiance are planning their dream wedding. And that is how this delightful episode of Undercover Boss comes to an end. On today's episode of Undercover Boss, the CEO of America's most loved sweet treat brand steps away from her high profile position to go undercover alongside her employees. She will discover systems that are frozen in time. Probably older than me. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 when I took over, it's, this is the register we've been using. And stores that are completely in chaos. Been running back and forth. That's a very big safety concern for me. And how will her employees react when they receive life-changing news? Stay with us to find out. Headquartered in Philadelphia, Rita's Italian Ice and Frozen Custard is an iconic brand selling Italian ices made fresh daily with real fruit, and their frozen custard is one of the most loved in the business. With over 580 stores and 15,000 employees, and an actual revenue of $150 million, we're introduced to the iconic brand holder and president and CEO, Linda Chadwick. Linda started her fast food career at 18, working at Burger King as a sandwich maker. She then went through every position within the restaurant and progressed quickly because of her hard work. And in 2017, she was offered the position of president and CEO at Rita's. Rita's was started by a Philadelphia firefighter, Bob Tumolo, in 1984 with his mom's water ice recipe. He started selling four flavors of ices on his porch and it became so popular that the brand just did not stop growing. And finally, in 1989, the family decided to franchise. When Linda came in at CEO, she found that there were some challenges in supply chain and marketing, which led to some franchise owners not being happy. Her goal is to modernize Rita's and to make it more competitive in today's market. And since she joined the company, 
company, Redis has gotten a new cash register system, more drive through places, and they also revolutionized their distribution system. But she feels the only way she could actually see all the problems in the company is if she goes undercover and sees it for herself. Linda will be going undercover as Marcy Morgan, a retired teacher from Massachusetts, and her employees will be told that they're in a documentary following a woman who's looking to start over in a new career. For her first job, she travels to Tom's River, New Jersey, to work with a franchise owner on a newer location. She meets up with Herzon, who gives her a uniform and then teaches her how to use the cash register. She first notices that the cash register are not one of the new ones, and he tells her that the cash register was there when he was, and it was even there when he rented the shop. The register is old. Mm -hmm. This is probably older than me. When I took over, it's, this is the register we've been using. Linda is disappointed that he's still working on the old cash register and that her efforts to implement the new digital registers were not being used by some of the owners. And it all gets worse when a customer tries to buy ice cream with a credit card and when she tried to scan it, it took so long because the credit card reader was using a dial-up connection. Linda was very frustrated. So it takes longer to process. Dial-up. I know, it's, it's, it's old school. Yeah. <laughs> especially because it was 2017 and somebody was still using dial-up. When I took a credit card order, it was so slow. Quite honestly, it was, it was driving me crazy. And customers started to line up because they couldn't process the payment faster. He tells her the reason he is still on the old system is because it's expensive, and when he became a franchisee, he had to spend a lot of money on other stuff like branding and flooring. The next day our CEO travels to Holland, Michigan to work with another franchise owner who recently put a drive through at her location. Stephanie recently put in a drive through at her location. There is a definite blueprint in making our drive through successful. She meets up with Stefani, who teaches her how to make different ice creams, and Linda also learns a little more about how Stefani operates the shop, which she actually finds a little distasteful as Stefani doesn't follow the company's rules on the opening time, which is the standard time for all stores to open, but Stefani had decided that she wants to do it her way and opens two hours later. It has to be open from 12, but we don't open until 2, uh, mostly because that was something that I dictated that works best for my family. Linda goes to work in the drive-thru and finds another problem there too, like having no sign to lead the customers on where they should get their order, and she asks her why they don't ask for help from corporate to implement the right system, but Stefani responds by saying that she wants to run the store her way. So being that this is my business, I am going to do what I need to do what's best for my family, regardless, in the end, what Rita's corporate may or may not want us to do. Linda also notices that the communication system for the drive-thru is old and doesn't work properly. And later, Stefani's little kids, which she brought to work because she didn't want to leave them at the daycare, start running around and screaming and disturbing customers. All of this really frustrates Linda, and she finally decides to reveal her true identity. Okay. I'm really not Marcy Morgan. I'm Linda Chadwick, CEO Stop. of Rita's. No, you're not. <laughs> and you're on Undercover Boss. Oh, okay. She tells Stefani that the drive-thru will be shut down until it's working properly, and Stefani didn't know what to say, so they decide to shut down the drive-thru. The next day, Linda travels to Orlando, Florida to work with a franchise owner, Andrew, and they meet up in the morning and get right to the job. Andrew is very good at his job and teaches her really well. That one is actually used for banana split. That sounds really good. Oh, the banana split's really good. A lot of work, but totally worth it. But she sees that even his shop is not using the new inventory system and that he is still writing on paper. He tells her that he prefers writing on paper because the new website still lacks a lot of things and that it's just more frustrating to use that. Unfortunately, could also be better organized. Okay. Some of the things are just not where they should fit with the rest of the items. Linda recognizes rushing the new system was not a good idea and she plans to improve on that. Responsibility and go speak to my team so that we can have a more effective system in place so that Andrew can use the method. Later he introduces her to pastiche and she teaches her how to use the new cash register and take orders. So first thing we are going to do is I want to show you the cash register. So you press Italian eyes mm -hmm. and then right here you're gonna hit kids eyes. She does that for the rest of the day and while working with with her, Linda learns that Pastiche is autistic and uses art to help other people like her. She also learns that Andrew took her in when she couldn't get a job at other places and she has now become his best employee. And finally, Linda's undercover time has come to an end and she's seen the good, the bad, and some of the ugly. So she invites her employees to her office to reveal her identity. 
First in was Hezron, and she tells him that she had a great time working with him, but she was frustrated with the cash register system, so she gives him $5,000 so he can upgrade both the cash register and the internet connection. She also gives him a $60,000 ice cream trailer truck so he can be able to sell product on events. She then goes on to award him $10,000 for his hard work and dedication to the company. Next in was Stefani, and she tells her that her rogue take on the business and not following the company standards has really hurt the company brand, but she tells her that she wants to help her reopen the drive through so she gives her $25,000 so she can fix everything before reopening. She then offers to mentor her personally and help her grow in her store. And last in was Andrew, and she tells him that the day she spent with him was very special, and she also tells him that she's invested $500,000 to improve the inventory system, and she then tells him that she was inspired by him for hiring people with disabilities, and she asks him to call Pastiche on the phone, and Linda asks her to come to headquarters to talk to the team to create a diversity initiative for Rita's. She then gives her $15,000 and another $5,000 to help her publish her book. $5,000? to help you publish your book. <laughs> and for Andrew, she gives him another $15,000 for his upcoming wedding and honeymoon. In the week since, Andrew has gotten his dream wedding and is planning their honeymoon, Pastiche is finishing her book before publication, Hezron has gotten his new cash register and is no longer delaying his customers, and finally, Stefani's franchise is thriving and her drive through is open for business. That is it for today's amazing episode of Undercover Boss. Will he be able to survive among his employees and can he really handle the gritty reality of manual labor after years of luxurious living as Sheldon, the CEO of Belfer, takes on the ultimate challenge challenge by going undercover within his own company. Stick around on this thrilling role of deception and discovery as Sheldon transforms into Tom Kelly and enters a world he's never seen before. Belfour is a billion dollar disaster restoration company with so many branches across the US and worldwide. And Sheldon, the CEO, is gonna go undercover as an unemployed insurance salesman. How will the incredibly rich Sheldon be treated amongst his employees? What will he find out? And can he really handle a day of manual labor after years of lavish living? Sheldon goes undercover as Tom Kelly. His employees are told that this is some kind of show where a man and a woman do the same job and at the end, one of them has has the opportunity to get a job at Belfour. Sheldon's first undercover assignment is with Joe, a restoration technician that works for his company. Things were pretty nice with Joe until Sheldon was unable to perform as well as he thought he would, and since Sheldon was a newbie, Joe made him take out a dead animal that they found in the walls, and that was a bit alarming for Sheldon. As Sheldon got to spend more time with Joe, he got to learn more about his personal life, and Joe is a father of two, and he's now working side jobs just to keep food on the table. Even though Joe works for Belfour, there aren't really that many restoration jobs that can keep him afloat and provide constant revenue. And because of this, he has to do a lot of other side hustles to pay off some of his debts and his mortgage. Hearing this was quite difficult for Sheldon, as he has a family of his own, and it was difficult for him to hear another man saying that he can't really make ends meet just by working hard on his day job. After spending a day with Joe, the restoration technician, Sheldon heads over to Colorado to meet Drew, a carpenter. And after spending half the day with Drew as a carpenter, Sheldon realizes just how physically demanding and difficult Drew's job is. As they catch up during their lunch break, Sheldon learns that Drew even has a master's degree, but because of his student loans and his rent, he can't really afford not to work and look for other jobs. He wants to work in marketing, but he realizes that he's gonna require a lot of connections to actually get a job. Sheldon takes a good impression of Drew and realizes that he has a lot of untapped potential that's now being squandered by the lack of a good opportunity. Next, Sheldon heads to Brenda, a cleaning technician that works for his company. He found Brenda to be an incredibly lovely and positive person, and we see her trying her best to walk him through her daily work routine. Brenda's backstory is a pretty difficult one to hear as she spent a lot of her time in poverty, but she's still thankful for the job and opportunity that she has now, and even though her current job doesn't really pay much, she tries to do her hardest to make customers feel comfortable. Hearing Brenda's story and all the adversity and challenges that she faced, Sheldon couldn't help but break down crying as he realizes just how blessed he is because of his financial security and he realizes that it's a privilege that not a lot of people can afford. The last one on Sheldon's list was Jen, 
a water technician. Jen's specific job is to deal with water damage inside of homes. It's a quite demanding job and Sheldon gets a first-hand experience as he goes into the crawl space inside the house to perform water damage checks with Jen, which was not really that easy. Going under the crawl space that day though was not the most difficult thing that Sheldon had to do, as hearing Jen's story about how she got promoted but still hasn't really gotten a raise yet really made him emotional and he revealed himself to her as he wanted her to know that corporate does actually care about the little guy. Now, after spending a day with four of his employees, Sheldon has a lot of big decisions to make. The next day he gathers some of his executives and they make a decision that they need to reach out more to their people and try and address their personal concerns that's related to the company. With this thought in mind, the employees get invited back to headquarters thinking that they're there to cast a vote between Sheldon and his other female competitor. Sheldon reveals himself to the employees starting with Drew and offers him 15k to pay for his student loans and he also arranges for him to meet his top marketing people in his company so that Drew can manage to get a better job. Next, Sheldon offers Joe a promotion as project manager and also offers him $10,000 on his commission fees which Sheldon says that Joe will definitely acquire. In addition to that, he also gives him $10,000 so he can pay off some of his mortgage. After Joe's surprise, it was time for Brenda and Sheldon offers her $10,000 toward the education of her grandchildren and also offers to teach her some skills so that he can promote her in the future and he wasn't done yet as he offers her $15,000 for her own personal use. Last but not least, Sheldon meets up with Jen and tells her just how moved he was by her concern about corporate not really caring about the employee and tells her that he is going to meet with hundreds of his employees six times a year to bridge the gap between the employees and the administration. He also offers her a week's paid vacation and gives her the back pay for all the hours that she worked without getting a raise. And on top of all of that, he gives her a $15,000 bonus check. And this is how today's episode of Undercover Boss comes to an end.